David prayed, <clears throat> Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful. After his years of adultery, or his more than year-long issue and stance with adultery, murder, and the covering up of that particular sin, David could only pray those words, be merciful to me. This year we've been thinking about um, <clears throat> what it means to pray and to pray correctly. Just go ahead and kill the, the, the PowerPoint here. We've been thinking about what it means to pray and to learn what it means to pray in the Jesus way. And looking at the Gospel of Luke and um, <clears throat> learning not only from the prayer life of Jesus himself, but also the things that he uttered concerning prayer and what they teach us. And over the last few months, we've been examining in particular, um, <clears throat> there are certain major categories of prayer that are many times discussed. And so we spent some time thinking about the prayer of praise, where we just focus on praising God for who he is. And then we talked about the prayer of pain. How do we pray through pain and, and pour out our being before God? Where we come to today is talking about the prayer of pity. When we're seeking the forgiveness of God and we can say only the words that this tax collector said, which are almost identical to the words that David prayed in Psalm 51, and that is just be merciful. And so what I want us to do as we look at <clears throat> this parable in Luke's gospel, verses 9 through 14, is <clears throat> look at it through what prompts Jesus to tell the parable. This is one of the times where he's very explicit in saying, this is why I'm telling the parable. And then look at the parable and see the point of the parable, and in particular, the point of the parable thinking through the words and the posture and the way <clears throat> that the tax collector, or as some translations will say, public, and how he offered his prayer, and what it shows us about how we pray for God's pity and for God's mercy. And so as we think about, first of all, what prompted it in verse 9, he tells us, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they treated others with contempt. So the first reason he tells the parables, you've got a group of individuals who are not exactly certain as to who they are. There are some who are trusting in themselves that they are righteous. That is, <clears throat> it goes to the old question. If um, It was an old evangelistic question used in evangelical circles, but still it, it is a question that I think is somewhat effective and certainly one we need to consider. And that is, if you were to die today and you were standing before God... And he asked you, by what means should you be allowed to enter into heaven? What would your answer be? You see, a lot of people would answer that question by saying, well, I was a good Christian. I did this, I prayed, I went to church, I read my Bible, I tried to be kind to people. And while those things are good, those things are the wrong answer. The basis of us being admitted into God is not, the answer to it is not found in the first person, because I. It's found in the third person, because he. The only reason I'm here is because of something far beyond me. And that is because Jesus has done something for me I could never do for myself. Because while all those things that we talked about were good... They were done by me only because I learned them and embodied them through Jesus and what he did to, to me. God had to forgive me and welcome me and transform me just to be able to do those things. It's not those things that made me suitable to stand before and to serve God. And so when we trust in ourselves, that's the idea. We, we in essence, whether we go through it formally and ask ourselves the question, I'm going to heaven because, and we insert our answer, or... If it is because it's just something that's there underlying, we tell ourselves, this is why. I remember sitting with <clears throat> uh, an older gentleman in, who has since passed away. Uh, but one of my elders at the time, we went to see him. He was not a Christian. And 
I was kind of just the passing observer here. One of our elders was taking the lead at that particular time. And so he began to ask him and talk to him about Jesus and the things of, that come after this life is over. And to hear his response, it was one like this. Well, you know, I've been a pretty good person. <clears throat> and not a lot of people know this, but I've helped save two people's lives. And I think come judgment day, that'll be enough. You see, we are, as human beings, we have this propensity to think that we make up for. That even though we might be bad, as long as we do enough good things, it can make up for the bad ones. But that's not Christianity. You see, if you want a religion, and I, and I don't mean this in any harsh way, but if you want a religion where the basis of your justification, your salvation is, my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, then you need to convert to Islam because that's their belief system. To where your good deeds must outweigh your bad deeds and thus upon that, you may be entered into the afterlife. That is the religion you're looking for. Christianity is not that religion. Christianity is entering into the kingdom of heaven solely upon who Jesus is. And so, <clears throat> trusting in ourselves, we have the same issue that they had at that time. We trust in ourselves that we're righteous, that we've done enough. And we hear it sometimes on the opposite side of the spectrum where people say, and they wonder, have I done enough? You see, when we are asking that question, it still betrays something about the depth of our heart that says what? I still feel like I have to attain to. We can't trust in ourselves, and that's what he's doing. But not only are they trusting in themselves, they do what many people who trust in themselves do. They also look down upon, they despise others. The idea behind it is literally to look down upon them. We have this tendency to look at people and go, huh, you don't measure up to me. And again, we don't necessarily say it in those terms. But we look at a person and we go, you know, I'm at least here every service. They aren't. People say, you're saying it's not important to attend? No, wouldn't say that either. But if I look at my attendance record and think that somehow that makes me right before God and this person is less loved by God because their attendance record looks different than mine, then I've got a problem. I'm despising, I'm thinking down, I, I see myself as better. That's why Jesus tells this parable. Because <clears throat> there is this natural human propensity to think that we have to scale ourselves up to God and, and that basically what is happening when we come to God is this. So we're lost and we're sinful, we'll admit that. And, and God saves us through Christ. And in essence, what we, the way we think about that is this. God makes an investment in us. He grants us seed money to forgive us. And then we spend the rest of our lives returning his investment on us. And we pay him with that. We pay him back his seed money and his profits. And therefore, at the end of life, it's just kind of even, you know. He took a chance and made an investment. He made a good investment. I paid him back and I made him money. Nothing could be further from the truth. So, because of our tendency to think that way, he then tells this parable. And as we think about the parable, <clears throat> we are introduced to two men who are entering into the temple, to, to the temple precincts in order to pray. So he says, two men went up, literally going up in elevation, the temple mountain. There's a reason it's called the temple mount. It was an ascent. They went up into the temple to pray, whether it be <clears throat> the hours of prayer. They had three hours of prayer, usually at 9, 12, and 3 in the afternoon. 9 in the morning, 12, and then 3 in the afternoon. <clears throat> or whether it be any other time. They're going up <clears throat> into the temple. The temple, the place that God had decreed would be the house of prayer for all nations. They're going to the place where people would pray in Jerusalem. And then we have our two characters of this story introduced. You've got a Pharisee and a tax collector. 
Now, these two guys couldn't be more different if they were trying. The Pharisees, what, what we have to keep in mind when we look at them is this. We, we have a bad taste in our mouth about Pharisees because of what the New Testament says and how they are portrayed and exposed for their hypocrisy. But you have to remember that to hear the parable away, the way the original hearers would have heard it, you have to completely remove that notion. You remember we've talked about this. The Pharisees developed out of that intertestamental period of how do Jews reconcile? How do we live with a hostile foreign government over us? What is our relationship to God? How is it worked out in living under Gentile oppression? The Pharisees' attitude was to be separatist. We separate ourselves from them. We keep ourselves pure. We radically dedicate ourselves to the law of God. It's estimated around the time of Jesus there were some 6,000 Pharisees. They were considered and they were looked at by all of the Jewish people. Even those who disagreed with them, they were looked at and they were respected for their dedication to God. Even if they disagreed with them, you could at least admire them. And so when they hear this parable, they hear a Pharisee, they see the champion. They see the one that... I mean, he's going, to, he's going to be faithful. He's going to do everything that's expected of him. And then you've got a tax collector. You've got a turncoat, basically, in their minds. He has embraced the Roman government. He has bought his position. The Roman government had a certain standard or quota he had to meet. Everything he raised beyond that was simply his. And many times that led to massive extortion. Not always, but it did lead to extortion. And that's why even when they come to the baptism of John in John chapter 3, the, Pharisees, or the uh, tax collectors ask, what shall we do? What do we do? How do we live? How do we bear fruits of repentance? And he says, don't charge more than, you're, than is necessary. Don't extort people. And so here you've got two men, one who represents everything that is religious and everything that is separatist and everything that is following the law of God to a T. And then you've got the tax collector who is one who is a turncoat. He, he, he doesn't, in their minds, he's a traitor. So, how do you think this thing is going to play out when they both go into the temple to pray? Or maybe if we put it in more contemporary terms, two men went into the temple, or... A man and a woman went into the temple to pray. The one a preacher, the other a prostitute. It's the same thing. Tax collectors are, in scripture are associated with prostitutes. Matthew 21, 31, and 32. But they both go with the intentions of praying to God. And then we are introduced to the, <clears throat> the Pharisee. And the, it says the Pharisee standing by himself. And translating this phrase, the ESV says standing by himself. And then it says that he um, <clears throat> not only stands by himself, but he prayed thus. And so it, this is a difficult phrase to translate. So your translation may read differently than the ESV. Because it's hard to know exactly what is being communicated. Is he praying to himself? That is like... Is it um, in the sense that it's a silent prayer that no one can hear? Or is it an audible prayer? Is it um, that he's literally just addressing himself? Is Jesus trying to make this, this play out of a picture that it, he's supposedly addressing God, but he's really just addressing himself? Or that he has just somehow separated himself from everybody else and he doesn't want anybody else around him because he doesn't want to contaminate himself? Whatever it be, he has separated himself in some way. Whether in physical proximity or in his mind, he is praying and standing, which was the common posture of prayer. He's praying, and this is his prayer. God, I thank you that I am not like other men. I thank you I'm not like other men. And then he proceeds to list these sins extortioners those who cheat people out of their money tax collectors unjust adulterers or even like this tax collector you see 
the danger of comparison. This is what he means when Jesus explains why he gives the parable in verse 9, or Luke explains for Jesus why he's giving the parable, that they thought they were righteous and they looked down on others. They treated them with contempt. But the idea, the principle is he's making a comparison. If I look at myself next to someone, listen, it doesn't matter who you are. You can always look at yourself, find somebody worse, and make yourself feel better about who you are. That can happen. The problem is is that the Pharisee is doing just that. What What the publican or the tax collector does is something that is radically different. So he says, I'm not like extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like a tax collector. This guy over here in our parable. Well, again, you notice his standards aren't very high either, right? I'm not an extortioner. You know, truth be told, there are not just a ton of extortioners in the world. I'm not an adulterer. There are a lot of people who go through their lives and never commit adultery once. And beyond that, if you want to just get technical about it, there will be people in heaven who on earth committed adultery. People say, no way, David. They acknowledged their sins, they repented of their sins, they brought them to God, they were forgiven. So if you use that person as a standard, say, oh, I've never committed adultery. Well, great. But that doesn't make you better than them. So that's kind of the negative side that says, look, and it's so typical because as all human beings, we have the the propensity to do this. I don't do these things. And, and that's why we're good people, because of the things that we do not engage in. But he takes it a step further and says, not only do I not engage in those things, these are the things I do engage in. I fast twice in the week. Most Pharisees fasted on Mondays and Thursdays because they believed Monday was the day that Moses went to receive the law, and Thursday was the day that he came down from receiving it. Christians that later in the first century, according to an uh, an early first century, or a late, I should say, late first century document called the Didache, which is kind of like a a manual for new converts, like a book for them to study from. Um, In Didache 8, they prayed, or they fasted twice a week as well, just on Wednesday and Friday. Okay? So he's fasting twice a week, which, by the way, that was only commanded one day in the year, the Day of Atonement, the 10th day of the 7th month, Leviticus 16. And so you see himself, I, I do this more than is required. Now, they developed some fasts from Zechariah chapter 8. You'll see God communicating with them that they had developed some fasts based upon the, the stages of the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. And they had created some customs there, but they weren't required by God. They were just created. Not necessarily bad practices, but not law either. So I fast twice in the week, and I give tithes of all that I get. I give a tenth of everything to God. You remember in chapter 23 and verse 23 of Matthew, Jesus commends them. He says, well, he condemns them, but he does commend the practice. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. That is, you take the seeds in your vegetable garden or even your, um, your spice garden that you have planted in your home, and you even go so far as to give a tenth of those things to God. And he says, But you've omitted the way to your matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These things ought you to have done, but also not leave the other undone. You needed to do all of it, not just part of it. So I'm giving tithes of all that I possess. Look at the check that I can write. 
Look at the money that I give. Look at the money that I donate. I want you to think about this man's prayer. He begins with God. And he never mentions him again. God, I'm here and I don't do these things and I do these things. That's it. Where is his need? Does he really believe that he is not sinful? But then you come to the tax collector. And it says, but the tax collector standing far off. What does far off have reference to? I mean, it could be a number of things. It could be he's standing far off from the, the temple complex itself. That is the actual structure of the holy place and the most holy place. Or it could be he's standing off from the Pharisee or from the group of people. Or maybe he's just standing off it by himself. Whatever it is, he has made some kind. There is some kind there's something about his posture that's a display. So he's standing afar off and would not even lift his eyes to heaven. Have you ever dealt with someone who was so ashamed over what they had done they couldn't look you in the eye? Have you ever been the person that's done something that was so bad you couldn't look a person in the eye? That's the Pharisee, or that's the tax collector. He can't. I can't bring myself to look even in his direction. But beat his breast. That is just... It's a sign of grief. It happens at the cross. The women do it in Luke 23 and verse 48. And so before we even hear what he says, I mean... Their postures, their, their approaches are, are wildly different. And so he says, God be merciful to me, a sinner. We're not going to break that down just yet because we're going to get to that in just a minute. But do you notice how simple and yet broken hearted an understanding of his own position that he illustrates? Just be merciful to me. That's the only thing that I ask. That's the only thing that I can say. And so Jesus draws then the point in verse 14. I tell you, this man, talking about the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. Because everyone who exalts himself, that's what the Pharisees did, he exalted himself. Look at what I haven't done, look at what I've done. God will cut them down, they'll be humbled. And the one who humbles himself and realizes what he has done doesn't make excuses that because of what I don't do and what I do, therefore what I've done doesn't matter anymore. He still sees himself for who he is. Everyone who humbles himself, God exalts. Now, what does, the pub, what does the publican or the tax collector teach us about praying for pity? What is the main point? The point of the parable is this. God's forgiveness is granted to the one who understands his or her need and cast himself or herself wholly upon the mercy of God. They understand their own need and they cast themselves wholly upon the mercy of God. Now pay attention to the short prayer that the, the tax collector prays. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, the offended party. God is the offended party. This is why David will say in Psalm 51, and a lot of people have been puzzled by it, that he, would, that he could say these words, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And people say, no, he sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against Uriah. He sinned. True. 
But all sin is ultimately a violation of God. It is an assault on His character. God is the offended party. And God, who in the Ten Commandments said, I will by no means clear the guilty. Exodus 25 and 6. If a person sins, punishment will be exacted. By the way, that didn't change in the New Testament. That's a wildly mistaken notion that people have. So he begins by looking at God, the offended part, or actually not even looking at God because he can't bring himself to look at him. Then he says, be merciful. Because he does know that when Moses asked God to see his glory, God denied the request to him to see his face. But he did say, I'll let you look at the backside of me and I'll tell you who I am. And this is what he said. The Lord, the Lord God, a God merciful and gracious. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. He knew that the God that he had offended would also, is also the same God who delights to be merciful to people. Who delights in forgiveness. But here's the thing, when you take a look, it's translated mercy in, in just about all translations of which I'm familiar, your mainline ones. But mercy is not actually... Um, Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a, a language expert, and the people who translate these things know far more about it than I will know in ten lifetimes. But the word itself is not even in the word family from which we translate mercy commonly in the New Testament. It's actually the word that's in the family that we translate very rarely in the New Testament called propitiation. The appeasement, 1 John 2. The appeasement of God's wrath. Talking about the anger of God that is directed towards sin. He doesn't say just be merciful. He says be propitious. Be propitiated. Let your anger be appeased when you see my sin and your holiness moves to judge it. Let your anger be propitiated. He's not asking God. Listen to this. He's not asking God to turn a blind eye to his sin. He's asking God to let the judgment fall upon himself. You see, propitiation was a concept that was permeated through every other religion in the world at that time. If you sinned, you had to offer your sacrifice. You had to propitiate and appease the anger. The, what makes the God of Israel and the God of the New Testament, the God of the Bible, so different is that he said, it will not be propitiated by you. I will not satisfy my anger by punishing you. I will satisfy my anger by punishing myself. I will punish my son. So I don't have to punish you. That's Romans 3, 21 to 26. That is the heart of the gospel message. But think about this. When he says be propitiated, you know what he sees? He sees that his sin is serious. That his sin is real. That sin is not something that you laugh off. It's something that incites the anger of God that then must be appeased. It's an assault on the character and the goodness of God. He seeks atonement. Be merciful to me, a sinner. He sees himself for who he is. Now here's the thing. Tax collectors in scripture are commonly given a very negative connotation by the people that surround them. And... It would seem that in many ways they probably earned that description. But it does not mean that there were zero honest tax collectors. 
doesn't mean that any of them, there are always exceptions to rules. So when he sees himself this way, whether this tax collector is a good man or a bad man in the eyes of our understanding, he still sees himself for who he is before God, and that is that he's sinful. And until and unless you and I see ourselves for who we are, there will never be a chance for forgiveness. There was a famed preacher <clears throat> who had dedicated himself greatly to a cause and was well respected and, and loved by so many. And one day a, a, an individual met him on the street and said, we love you, you've blessed our lives so much and you've meant so much to the cause of Christ and for the good that you have done. Thank you. He said, I don't deserve anything you've said. The person asked, why not? He said, because if you could see in my heart, you would spit in my face. Not because he was not a good, faithful Christian and godly man, but he understood that he was still a sinner. And there were things that, that still rested inside of him. Listen, how many of you, let's just say for a second we had the ability to do this. How many of you would be comfortable with this notion? We're going to turn this screen on and God is going to play the transcript of everything that has been through your mind and everything you have done for the last seven days right here. How comfortable are you with that? I'm not comfortable with that. I'm a sinful man. You are sinful people. And until we understand that, and that the only hope that we have is not in the fact that we show up to church or coming to God and saying, I've preached so many sermons. Who cares? You can preach a thousand sermons that are doctrinally correct and go straight to hell. No one cares. If you can't see yourself for who you are, not what I love about the tax collector is he doesn't come to God and he doesn't make excuses and he doesn't qualify, he doesn't do anything. It, he he embodies the words of the song. Um, I just dropped it, the name of it anyway. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. And then how the song concludes. <clears throat> Not the labors of my hands could fulfill the law's demands. And then he describe, we describe ourselves as we sing that song. Vile, dirty, sinful. Vile I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. That's it. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly.
in that song as it progresses. And there's a version of it that I hear where there's a men and women interchange. And in particular, to hear the women come in at this particular song is just beautiful. <clears throat> when it says, hangs my hopeless soul on thee. I don't have a chance. Listen to me. I don't have a chance without God's mercy. You don't have a chance without God's mercy. And when I feel that sense of desperation and I come to God... All I can say is what the tax collector said, what David said, be merciful to me. Because all David could say when Nathan confronted him was, I've sinned. Be merciful. And if a person this morning, realizing their sinfulness, will come to God, he will extend that forgiveness. He will be merciful. The tax collector brings himself to God knowing that God is merciful. And that's what he receives. And if a person comes today with a penitent faith, confessing Christ and being baptized in water, what does it mean, by the way, to call on the name of the Lord? What, did, what was meant to Paul when, he, when it was told to him pre-conversion? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What are you doing? As you're being baptized into the death of Jesus, you're crying out for God's mercy to be extended to you. Or maybe we're like this tax collector who was a child of God. And we need to be forgiven yet again. If we can help you do that this morning, we want to as we stand and sing this song.